Hello, hello, Randy. Welcome to the show. Um, I love asking this question right out of the gate. How does it feel to be Randy today? How does it feel? Wow, Brett. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And it feels great to be Randy today because Randy has made a significant change a year or so in his life, ago, a year ago in his life uh, of leaving the corporate world, a long run in the healthcare industry specifically, doing uh, what I want to do for a change uh, and working around my schedule or versus around somebody else's schedule. And uh, I live in Houston, Texas, and it's a drop dead gorgeous day in Houston, Texas today. So. Give us a little bit of background on your um, professional history summary, yeah. and then walk us right into that aha moment. So happy to, Brett. Uh, yeah, I was uh, I'm long running um, and uh, worked at ProMedic Health Systems, you're probably familiar with, in Toledo, Ohio, University Hospitals Health Systems in Cleveland. I left uh, the healthcare space in uh, 09, I think it was, and got into a private equity firm that was a Carlisle based spin off of Goodyear Tire and Rubber. So I was uh, the chief compliance and privacy officer for those corporations. And I got into it in the global space, and I was real excited about getting rich with stock options. And uh, you remember this, the, the crash of 08 and 09. And I suddenly saw my net worth cut in half and was concerned that I was going to lose my job with the private equity firm. And that's when I really said it was the aha moment that uh, I had a big target on my back because I made a healthy buck and uh, no performance related issues, just cost reduction. And so the aha moment was you need to find a different income stream mm -hmm. than your primary W-2 job. And uh, that's when I started off uh, into real estate and uh, have never turned back. Asset manager, in, in my definition, Brett, is the one that um, is the group of general partners in the syndication that oversees the, the operations of the asset, the execution of the business plan. Uh, the asset manager is the one that has routine communications with the on-site property manager. I live in Houston, Texas. I've got a property in um, Greensville, South Carolina. Uh, I don't get there very often, but we're in routine communication with the on-site property management. We hired them. So first we did thorough due diligence as to their qualifications to run our building, our, our complex. Want to make sure they had expertise in Greensville, South Carolina, and that they worked in this asset class, B-type asset class versus a C or an A, because that is a difference. Uh, we hire them, and then just as you said, uh, they take over the day-to-day -day operations. They're the one dealing with tenants, toilets, and termites, as we say. Um, we're on a, we set a business plan. Uh, we set an annual budget with them that uh, we're going to execute on. We're going to uh, measure ourselves to that budget financially in terms of occupancy and vacancies and concessions and all that. Um, and that's the end goal to meet our five-year plan to exit this building and return substantial gain to our investors. But that, that breaks down into that's the macro and, the, and the, on the micro is it's a weekly asset management call, or just as you said, we have a dashboard, we have KPIs. It's, it's first, what, what's the occupancy? It's not the physical occupancy, it's the economic vacancies. That includes concessions and bad debts and everything like that. We talk about maintenance requests. How long are the tenants' um, maintenance requests outstanding? Uh, we talk about lead flow. How many leads do you have coming in this week? How many tours have you had? How many tours have con converted to an application? How many applications have converted to a lease? Um, what are the renewals coming up next month and the month after? What's our KPI, our renewal rate percentage? Obviously, if you can keep a tenant in a unit, it's much cheaper and beneficial for everybody because you don't have to have those unit turns. You don't have to go in and paint it and clean it up and all that stuff. So there's a whole host of uh, uh, KPIs that we and I think as operators or asset managers, owners, put it that way, owners. Physicians are owners of their practices. Uh, they oversee the operations of their practice. So there's a lot of similarities there. 
I deal with several high net worth individuals as well, and some of them are extremely, I'll call them active passive investors. Mm -hmm. And then there are other ones that uh, set it and forget it. Um, so it's up to the, the limited partner's personality and how involved or how much they want to learn. Myself, when I was starting, like you said, uh, before I invested in any property as a limited partner, I, I physically drove the asset. I, I went to it, whether it was in Green, Greenville or- Greenville, <laughs> come on with the Greenville. <laughs> Greenville or, uh, yeah. or Tucson, I'm in Tucson, uh, or Dallas or Houston. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would go to the site and see the property and drive the comps. I don't do that anymore because I've gained comfort with a couple general partnerships that I work with who have been very successful. Um, but yeah, and questions to ask, you know, first and foremost, what's your track record? How, how have you done historically to pro forma? Um, what market focus do you have? I mean, are you anywhere or are you concentrating like the one of the, my general partner friends and I, I leveraged him because he focuses solely on Tucson. He's an expert in Tucson. He's mm -hmm. had like 12 different properties there, gone full cycle on eight of them. Um, wow. So that's big for an investor. Are you specializing in one area or are you partnering with people all across the country? Returns, and, and you hit it on the head, uh, it's more important for your audience to develop a relationship with a general partner, somebody like me or others, to understand what they're all about, right? You're going to give them your hard earned money. You really need to have a relationship with them. I was just uh, talking with a student yesterday and we were looking at a 40 unit rent roll. Uh, to your point though, it's that balance between keeping the tenant versus losing sight of the current market. Mm -hmm. This particular rent roll we were looking at, he'd had people that uh, hadn't had a contract, hadn't, hadn't renewed their lease since 21, going on oh, wow. three and a half, four years. And they were 150 bucks a month behind market rate. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is also the other delicate task to monitor is making sure yeah. you keep current market rates, but also uh, you want to retain tenants and where that balance is. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the volatility and the stabilization process too, if you're stabilizing, you know, keeping that, keeping that income coming if they're relatively close. Now, if you acquire something or you're sitting in and they're two, three hundred dollars under market rent, then it's uh, bye bye, baby, no. uh, you know, to get that stuff done, depending again on your cash flow piece, because I mean, where are your reserves? There's so much that goes into this. And I would say your physician audience who feels very secure and financially secure and they're not 99.9% .9 of them aren't going to be worried about the next meal. But if nothing else, I go back to that diversification strategy. Consider it because your financial advisors are trained in what they do, stocks and bonds. They're not going to advise you on any private placement offerings. But take a step back and see how the wealthy have done it across the country. I mean, whether you like them or not, the Donald Trumps of the world, that's what they've done all the way along as they've invested in private placement offerings such as these and they make an above average return. And that's how you're gonna boost your portfolio performance overall by having a percentage, whatever you wanna comfortable at. I've got 35% of my net worth in various multifamily properties. Uh, some would say I'm overweighted uh, compared, to the, compared to the Baylor model, which was only 12. So find your sweet spot and um, put something, just get started, I guess is the, the thing I would say. Uh, you know, t my old mentor, Rod Khalif, used to say, take massive action because I'm an analytical type. And I think a lot of physicians are too, you know, I, I don't know if you ever heard of the old illustration, ready, aim, fire. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ready. I aim, 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 and then fire. And some of my marketing friends are, they fire first, aim, and then ready. But my point of it is, is you got to take action. And there's a lot of hesitation in cutting that first check uh, or first investment. But you know, I've I've had uh, I've had some losses. I've had a lot more wins than I've had losses. One takeaway: ten years, I'm averaging 120 percent return on my portfolio wow. for all the ones I've gone for. So my listening, 100 percent has doubled my return. So I'm more than doubled my investment. 
over those properties that have gone full cycle on average, even, on average. even including those losses even including those losses nice nice so that, that would be kind of a fluff form of if you didn't include those losses. Yeah, yeah and I, I mean i can talk about that's another whole podcast i've had one yeah. that had zero i had one that lost yeah uh, and, and but i've had some really nice wins uh, four yeah. or five x multiples you know oh wow and wow. and and, and um, those are those are probably fewer and farther between now. And that doesn't even take an advantage. That doesn't even take into consideration the tax consequence, mm -hmm. because in all those, you're having massive passive losses build up to offset against your passive gains.